Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Haley Vey Beeman, and I'm so glad you're here as we celebrate the first Sunday in the season of Advent. If you have an Advent wreath or a candle in your home, I invite you to light one candle this week to mark our time together this season. And each Sunday, we will light an additional candle as we anticipate and watch for the birth of Christ. If you can hear me, give me a thumbs up or um, some words in the comments because my broadcast, at least on my phone, keeps interrupting. So I want to make sure that you all um, are getting a clear live stream of worship. I also invite you to enter celebrations that you have in the comment section on Facebook. And after a few announcements, we'll circle back and lift those up in our community. All right, thanks for your thumbs up, awesome. As you may be able to tell, I'm leading worship from my home today because it takes a few weeks out to plan uh, different elements in worship, like music, um, all the different things that will be featured. And so after receiving word of a positive uh, COVID test on our streaming team, we planned for this Sunday to be online. Our plan for the next few Sundays, though, is to be leading our live stream worship from the sanctuary. Of course, one thing we're learning this year is how to be as graceful as humanly possible in our ability uh, to make quick changes, be flexible, and pivot. With cases so high in our area right now, um, and with a new variant, I want to take a moment to again encourage everyone who is eligible to get their COVID booster and flu vaccines to do so. Um, if you're wondering how, I got mine. Well, I got my flu shot at my doctor and then I texted the Meyer Pharmacy and got an appointment the next day for my COVID booster. Um, so I hope that you will be about that. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to have you here in worship. But speaking of COVID, as a parent of a child under the eligibility age, um, as a pastor, and as a person who cares very much about all of you, I want to encourage your patience in our return to in-person worship. People are still getting sick, and some are unfortunately dying. People we know and care very much about. And as a congregation and wider church, it's our duty to have the utmost care and concern for God's people. With that in mind, I'm happy to give an update on the efforts that our council continues to make. Our council has faithfully led us with strength and perseverance throughout this pandemic. And they met last week and are implementing a team whose sole focus is to consider how other congregations may be worshiping in person in healthy ways to help further develop our steps uh, moving forward so that we can all feel confident in our congregation's return to in-person. So let us continue to have patience and perseverance in faith as we share in meaningful live stream worship in this time of pandemic. Uh, speaking of our council, they will be leading us through our annual meeting next Sunday, December 5th, I hope you all will attend. Immediately following uh, worship is when it will take place on Zoom. And the link to that meeting is posted in our weekly announcements email and on our ULC website. By next Sunday, we also hope that everyone will have their giving statements submitted. That helps us plan for the year ahead in ministry at ULC and for our support um, of the wider church ministries around the world. Thank you to those who volunteer their time on our website um, because it's a simple online form and the link to submit your intent to give is in our weekly email and on our homepage. For my last announcement this morning, I'm very excited to share with you about upcoming Sundays in the season of Advent. Next Sunday, before our annual meeting, we will worship and enjoy the musical gifts of many of our ULC choirs, including our music scholarship students, senior choir, and bell choir. Then on Saturday, December 11th, from 10 o'clock in the morning to noon, we celebrate Family Advent Day. This year, we're only inviting youth and children from plus their families from Worship Wednesday uh, to help keep the gathering smaller and to protect the health of our kids. 
So I am asking families to RSVP by next Sunday, December 5th, and that will help us prepare. You can send me an email, a call, or a text to RSVP. I'm really excited. It's going to be a fun and low-key morning of Advent joy, including games, treats, music, crafts, and more. Then on Sunday, December 12th, we celebrate with our Worship Expressions Jazz Service. Over the past few years, that service has been a beautiful way to experience the season, as well as other Worship Expressions services we have throughout the year. So we invite you and anyone who you'd like to share that link with to our worship to join us um, for Worship Expressions Jazz in just a couple of weeks. All right, let's go back to Facebook and see if anyone has lifted up celebrations. And if you haven't yet, but you'd like to, feel free to drop those in the comments. Hopefully everyone had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I'm not seeing any celebrations, but that doesn't mean you don't have them. Um, maybe you're being timid and that's okay, um, but know that we share in your joy. Well, as we continue our worship on this first Sunday in Advent, uh, we continue with the prelude. Now let us confess our sins before God and one another. Healing God, we come into this house broken and lost. We bring our worries and our fears. We bring the weight of having acted out in ways that hurt others, you, and ourselves. We wonder if there will ever be a time when your light will find us. Forgive what we have done and heal us. For the sake of the one who gave everything for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God offers new life and healing. The Lord invites us into a new way of being. Despite our sin, God forgives. Receive and welcome God's forgiveness. 
for you are made clean and whole again in the name of Jesus. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. During the season of Advent, before we light a new candle on the wreath, we say a prayer. So let us pray. We praise you, O God, for this evergreen crown that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the first candle on this wreath, rouse us from sleep, that we may be ready to greet our Lord when he comes with all the saints and angels. Enlighten us with your grace and prepare our hearts to welcome him with joy. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain and whose day draws near. Amen. Let us pray. God of restoration, when the Israelites were exiled, you invited them to accept a new way of living. Show us how to move forward when it seems that all is lost and hope seems difficult to maintain. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, we took a break from Worship Wednesday this week in anticipation of Thanksgiving. Our children have been working on sending letters to folks who may need a little extra hope this Advent, and we will be preparing a Christmas program for the fourth Sunday in Advent. So we definitely have that to look forward to. So instead of Worship Wednesday this week, I have a book that I would like to share. Um, it's a very special book for the season of Advent called Who is Coming to Our House by Joseph Slate and Ashley Wolf. It has a surprise at the end too, and we're not gonna get to that until Christmas. Have to wait and see. So who is coming to our house? Someone, someone, says Mouse. Make room, says Pig. I will butt aside the rig. We must clean, says lamb. Dust the beams, says ram. Who is coming to our house? Someone, someone, says mouse. Sweep the earth, says chick. Stack the hay, says goose, and quick. Spin new webs, says spider. I will line the crib with eider. Who is coming to our house? Someone, someone, says mouse. Someone's coming from afar. I will nose the door ajar, says the horse. But it is dark, says cat. They will never come, says rat. Yes, they'll come, says mouse. Someone's coming to this house. 
See all the animals gathered around. They're waiting for someone special. I wonder who it could be. I will lay an egg, says Hen. I will spread my tail for them, says the peacock. Who is coming to our house? Hmm, who do we have here? Mary and Joseph whispers mouse. And that's where I'll stop this story today as we prepare for the birth of someone very special. Of course, that's Jesus. We'll learn more about that story as we continue on in the season of Advent. Last week, we heard from the first prophet Isaiah who spoke to the northern kingdom of Israel in the time leading up to their destruction by the Assyrian Empire. Over the next hundred years, the southern kingdom of Judah alternated between a feeling of anxiety that something similar would happen to them and hope for what they called a kingdom. Ultimately, the northern kingdom was consigned to history as the ten lost tribes of Israel. The rise of the Babylonian Empire brought new threats to Judah. So God called the prophet Jeremiah when he was still in his youth to speak out about the unfaithfulness of the leaders and people. Jeremiah was unpopular as he criticized the moral, religious, and political compromises that were being made. And he was often imprisoned or his life was threatened. About 30 years into his turbulent career as a prophet, which included many ups and downs. It was the year 597 BCE. The Babylonian Empire won the first round and took many of the ruling class, including merchants and artisans, into exile. One of the royal court prophets claimed it would last only two years, but Jeremiah knew that this royal court prophet was just saying what people wanted to hear, not the truth. So today we read the letter Jeremiah sent from his home in a changed Jerusalem to those who had been taken to Babylon in this first round of exile. This is a reading from the prophet Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, a message to those experiencing trauma. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets and all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take spouses and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and the diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. 
When Jeremiah's words reach the exiles, they are experiencing trauma. They have been uprooted, displaced. The kingdom of Judah has been conquered and large numbers of Jews are deported to Babylon. They become refugees. The temple in Jerusalem is, distored, is destroyed brick by brick. Life has turned upside down. Any plans they had for their lives must be thrown out. Nothing is normal. Everything they have ever known has changed. They feel lost, hopeless, and despairing. And they're left with big questions. Has God abandoned us? How can we worship now? How will we carry on our traditions and lifestyle? Will we ever be allowed to go back? Does God even care? These are real life questions that not only the people in Babylon have asked, but many of us today. While our personal experiences vary, there is a collective sense of loss, anxiety, and tension. We are experiencing both collective and individual trauma throughout this pandemic. People have faced fears, illness, death, isolation, economic hardship, and loss. And there is a continuing refugee crisis where large groups of people forced from their homes are seeking asylum. Trauma is a human communal experience. And it often translates into a manifestation of grief through denial, anger, bargaining with God, depression, and also a sense of acceptance, as in this is the way it is, and we will live in response. Jeremiah's letter comes at a crucial point, addressing people who spend their time talking so much about how to get back to the way things used to be. How would you receive those words today? That's where the challenge lies. It's perhaps one of the greatest reasons that prophecy is difficult to grasp. It causes you to stop, to spend less and less time considering your own agenda and more time reflecting on God's plan and why it is that God has us in this place to begin with. Why spend so much energy trying to move back and stifle growth when the Lord is calling you to new ventures and forward momentum? As a people of faith, this is a difficult and crucial question to be asking. As a child, I remember learning about Newton's law of motion. And I remember, a body at rest tends to stay at rest, while a body in motion tends to stay in motion. This phrase and concept has stayed with me and made sense in a variety of applications. Jeremiah's letter to the people in exile speaks to Newton's law. And if we are the body, we ought to pay attention. Jeremiah shares God's call for the people to keep moving. Continue planting seeds, nurturing soil, growing families, and your faith and life together. To not be stifled, at least not forever, by this holy disruption. Keep forward momentum, even while you wait. And the Lord will be with you. Jeremiah writes, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you of the people and the experience that is before you. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. As our Bishop Craig Satterley has said in recent months regarding our COVID safety protocols, he says, stay the course. Stay the course. An important call in Jeremiah's prophecy too that can feel especially challenging when every attempt to find a new rhythm is squelched, when we know flexibility is important, but uncertainty can be exhausting, and when we tire of waiting. 
But Jeremiah the prophet shares God's thoughts on the matter, on how we can stay the course. One step at a time. One moment. One faithful decision. One day at a time. And for Israel, that meant accepting this way of life as their reality for now. Even though they'd rather be in a place they used to live, now they're called to build a city and a people with strong foundations and plant their roots deep in this time and place and honor the land on which they now live. To raise children from generation to generation with faith and knowledge of God, and to seek the welfare of the people in the time and place in which they live today. And to not be rushed, because they'll be there for a while. God only knows how long. In living their lives this way, they will also be living according to God's plan in God's time. And just because it's God's time, I'm not saying that means it's easy. Sometimes following God can cause mourning to come before the dancing. Because whether we resist or embrace change, we may also grieve for what we miss about the past. The truth of Emmanuel though, is that God is with us in all of those spaces. With the student and teacher whose academic life is rocked by a world turned upside down. With the parent worn out from raising children in a pandemic who needs their village and time for renewal. With those of you who advocate for a loved one's health who are staying the course by refusing to give up. With a local business owner or employee who stays the course and learns to build your business online and it becomes fruitful, maybe even more than before. With a first time politician whose platform helps constituents believe in a better way for their community who may not have won this election, but who's added energy to a movement and who can't quit now because hope is alive and the next election cycle is coming with those already feeling isolated when this pandemic began because of retirement or the death of a loved one or a shocking diagnosis, the loss of a marriage or a job. With everyone feeling this sense of exile, of displacement, of loss, Jeremiah's words are the reminder of Advent hope. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I will fulfill to you my promise. And if ever there was a time for Advent, it's now. To begin this season leading up to Christmas with Jeremiah's prophetic words of God's promise being fulfilled for people who are growing weary, who long for hope and newness of life. But in these often uncomfortable exile spaces, Jeremiah's message from God is to keep on living. Try something different than maybe you have before. Go ahead and learn to love again. Find new work, plant some crops, seek new ways to worship, sew quilts for refugees, teach children that hope is more powerful than hate, lead hunger initiatives, work for the equity of all people, join choir on Zoom, help maintain the building and grounds at church so we have a safe and healthy place to gather in person when the time comes. In all this, believe that the Lord is Emmanuel, God with us, and then keep on living like it. As we lean into the season of Advent, a season of hope, how will we lean into this promise of God? How might our energy shift from grief to hope? 
What can we have to look forward to? How will we, though many in this community and throughout the earth, become one body in motion for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ? How will we be moved to faith over fear? And how is God calling us to truly live as we wait? I hope you'll keep watch with me this Advent for the signs of God's presence during a season of waiting and hoping. Will you seek out holy moments of comfort and joy? Will you plant seeds of hope even where it's least expected? Because God has promised that at some point this trauma will end. Your mourning will turn to dancing. Unlike the people in Babylon, we have hope in knowing how the rest of the story goes. We know because we have experienced that God keeps God's promises. So while we wait, let us pray and let us act so that we can keep reminding each other and the world of God's present and future hope, of God's promise, that out of the ruins and rubble, out of the smoke, out of our night of struggle, there is a ray of hope when we can build a beautiful city, not a city of angels, but a city of humans. Amen.
Let us confess the faith of the Church with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we continue with the sharing of our gifts and offerings, we sincerely thank you for your continuous and generous support of the ministries we get to share, which could not happen without your gifts of prayer, energy, and financial support. So as a reminder, you can give for the first time or continue giving with the ways that are on our screen. Those are through direct deposit through MSU FCU, the donate button on our ULC website, which is a form of PayPal, or by mailing a check to the church. And a reminder also of our outreach of the month, Citizens for Prison Reform. You can visit our website to learn more about this organization as well as Open My Door, an organization I'll share more about in the upcoming offering video. This week in our announcements, hopefully you took note of the petition from Open My Door that you can sign, brought to us by the ULC Racial Justice Team addressing the issue of solitary confinement in prisons, particularly among BIPOC, Black, Indigenous people of color, and more vulnerable populations who are at risk in solitary confinement, including people with intellectual and physical disabilities, cognitive or sensory impairment, youth and people over the age of 55, pregnant women and new mothers, and people who identify as LGBTQIA. Keeping in mind our care and concern for all people in Christ's name, let us pray our offering prayer together. God of hopefulness, when we are lost or broken, we know that healing can come when we reach out rather than isolate, give rather than withhold. So we bring our offerings to you in hope that abundant blessings come not only for us, but for those who benefit from these gifts that we share. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm Lois Polano, Executive Director of Citizens for Prison Reform and Coordinator of the Open My Door campaign. We welcome you back for the final week of information sharing around the Open My Door campaign the work of addressing the use of solitary confinement or isolation across Michigan. We believe that you can best learn and understand the traumatic impact on all of those involved by the sharing of lived experiences. Today, we're going to share a short video clip that was produced by the ACLU of Michigan and as well, families' personal shared experiences of what it has been like for them having a loved one in solitary confinement and how it has impacted their lives. Thank you. Sabri Alexander was a 27 year old woman who struggled with a multitude of physical and mental conditions. Her challenges included an aggressive seizure disorder and severe depression. Sabri was also bipolar. In April of 2014, Sabri was sentenced to serve two to 20 years in Huron Valley's Women's Correctional Facility. Her lawyer and family begged the court to place Sabri in a facility that could help manage her mental conditions. Their motions were denied. Seven months later, Sabri Alexander died alone in an isolation cell. For two days, her screams of terror went ignored by prison officials assigned to supervise her. Sabri's young son is left without a mother. We are left with a prison system that does not protect its most vulnerable inmates, many of whom are destined to suffer and die as Sabri did. This is the story of the tragic death of Sabri Alexander, but in many ways, it's also the story of thousands of other American men and women who are broken each day by the cruel and unusual punishment of solitary confinement. 
There are a huge number of people with very serious mental illness in solitary confinement in the United States prisons. I'm embarrassed that this is going on in my country. At every level of care, these people have been neglected and treated badly. Solitary confinement is when a prisoner is alone in his or her cell for nearly all the day, every day. We want to invite you to join us in the fight to end solitary confinement in Michigan. There are so many ways you can get involved and show your support. You can purchase an Open My Door t-shirt, you can sign and share our petition, volunteer with the organization, or donate. We are so grateful to have your help. Together we will end solitary. We continue our worship with the prayers of the church, mindful that the response to each petition is receive our prayer. You may also now share any prayer requests you have in the comment section on Facebook. We pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. May Emmanuel find welcome in our hearts, take flesh in our lives, and be for all people the welcome, advent of redemption and grace comforting god receive our prayer you give us peace which the world cannot O lord discourage us from seeking after temporary assurances instill generosity within us during a season that can often become a frantic scramble to take care of our own concerns open us to the unfolding mystery of your presence among us comforting god receive our prayer we give you thanks for a time to pause in gratitude for all the blessings of our lives we thank you for family for food and shelter for friends and neighbors and our church community bless all those who find themselves alone on holidays whether by choice or otherwise and make us one great human family comforting god receive our prayer we ask for your blessing upon ecumenical partners, the Northwest Lower Michigan Synod, Bishop Eaton, Bishop Satterley, and our pastors, Haley Vay and Pastor Gary. We pray for Reverend Ken Johnson and Reverend Jacob Lehman at Trinity Lutheran in Kalamazoo, comforting God. Receive our prayer. There's more suffering in the world than we can comprehend, and yet, you hold us all in the palm of your hand. Pour out your healing spirit on all who cry to you. Send a special blessing to friends and family lifted in this week's announcements and be with Kim Kravitz, Joseph Kravitz, Carl Bennett, Ed Venos, Michael Kruger, Bruce Reinel, Harry Coast, Phyllis Coast, Jesse Archer, Connor Hagman, Greg Hagbaum, Brenda Sternquist, Melissa Andreessen, and Andrew Earl, comforting God. Receive our prayer. Like the saints before us who waited on the fulfillment of your word, we find our peace in your faithfulness to all generations. Uphold us with your promises still and assure us of our place among those who adore you eternally, comforting God. Receive our prayer. We now invite you to share any individual prayer petitions that you may have in the comment section. We pray for Matthew's, Matthew Ubel's mother, Dawn, as she has a hip replacement tomorrow. We pray for Aaron, Sherry, and Tucker Sparks as they mourn the loss of their son and brother Jackson in the Christmas parade tragedy last week. And we give thanks for the prayer quilts that will be sent to them. We pray for the family and friends of Art Alvera who died yesterday. We pray for healing and peace for Michael's brother, Kent Leroy. 
Bill and Linda pray for a dear friend having heart surgery this week. And I'd like to pray for all those who travel. And all those who may be feeling lonely or heart sick this holiday season, that they might feel a sense of community through your church and through those who show up for them. Miriam prays for healing for her sisters. We pray for healing and peace for Larry's sister, Marilyn Rabideau. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the hope of the Christ child, whose life brings new life for all. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now may you receive this blessing with an open heart. May the Lord bless and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Thanks be to God.